this is a little bit tough to share. I am in a room with a woman and she actually reaches between my legs. And she says, I need to see it. So I look up and have the exact same look on my face that you have right now looking at me. So where did we leave off last time? Well, I had just gotten on a plane to join my dad in Abu Dhabi. That's right. That's right. Uh, which I did. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my dad was sharing a three-bedroom apartment with another two doctors that this particular clinic had put up. Hmm. And so I got to stay with my dad in the one room that they were all, you know, that he was sharing in the apartment. It wasn't a very long period of time. And then my mom and my sister joined us. So maybe, I don't know, probably a couple of weeks or something. It wasn't very long. It was just you two. It was just the two of us. And, and so at this point, our relationship is a little strained, right? Oh, because, really? <laughs> just a tad, mm -hmm. right? So remember the conversation on the couch of the old apartment? Go be like them. We're going to stay here forever. Mm -hmm. You need to be just like these people. And this is going to be your new home. And I think this is when it started to sink into dad that I had taken his words very literally. And so it was the beginning of us kind of seeing things differently in, in how I thought he wanted me to be versus how he wanted me to be. So it was interesting. It was an interesting time. He was trying to reconnect. I, of course, was hurt, longing for the boy I had left behind in England, you know. And so it was a little bit tough. But, um, but we made it through, and mom and my sister arrived. And when, we, when they did, they didn't leave us in the room. The owner of the clinic actually moved us into his home. And the typical home in the UAE by the locals were these compounds. They were giant mm -hmm. houses, and they had multiple buildings on the, on the actual property. And then they were surrounded by 12-foot concrete walls with gates and everything. I have a question. Yes. This, let's call it three weeks with your dad. Was mm -hmm. that the one time in your childhood that you, it was just you two living together for any extent, any period of time? Oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Does that hold any significance for that reason? You kind of brushed over it, but I mean, I, I imagine yeah. it must, or maybe not, but maybe not though. Um, I remember it being, there were some good times, because there were interesting, you know, we had outings, you know, with the, with the actual other two doctors. We would we took some drives and checked out, saw some of the other Emirates. So there were good quality times, but I also found it awkward and uncomfortable for the most part because there wasn't a lot of open conversation between us. Um, I think we had gone from the the life lessons which continue on through my life but at that moment i think there was just this unspoken tension between the two of us of course um of course about the path that i was taking versus where he would have wanted me to go makes a lot of sense you know yeah um, and you were 12 and 13 yeah so now i'm about 12 yeah between 12 and 13 yeah yes and that age already is <laughs> Conversation is not abundant at that age <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so. and, and, and would you say that your culture, the Iranian culture, um, old or whatever it was at that time, if mm. you want to call it new at that period, of course, was it, um, do you think it, it was more the mother had relations with the children and the father did his own thing? Yes. Yes. So, that, yeah. so it's interesting that you would even, do you think he was uncomfortable with the fact that he had those that that period with you in the first place i think it was a little bit awkward i agree with you yes because it was the primary relationship was was between the mother and the children that's right um it's interesting because i actually in later years his closeness was was very apparent with my sister so i think it was different because maybe the times had changed maybe his life had changed mm -hmm. so they were a lot more open and close with one another but he and i you're right it was very much kind of just as awkward for him as it was for me during this period of time yeah gotcha. yeah definitely wow. yeah. 
so anyway, um, they moved us into the, the, so the owner of the clinic moved us into his guest home, guest house in his home for a while while we found an apartment to live in. And um, during that time, I started to be exposed, or we all did, to the Arab culture, which is similar to the Iranian culture, but quite different in certain ways. And um, I found them to be so hospitable. They were such kind people. Every morning, the doors would open to the guest house and the servants would come in and a giant tablecloth would be laid on the floor and just, I mean, think about it. It's me, my sister, my mom and dad. And yeah. this giant tablecloth that would go the... Um, the length of a huge ball ballroom type dining room. Oh my gosh! Yeah, with plate after plate of, after plate of food. I mean, literally after a few first few days, my dad was like, "Okay, you guys have to stop." Because, Who are these people? Well, they're just. Um, Who are you staying with? Who are these people? Th- this with, is also the immense so this, wealth. It sounds. It, like. it is. It is. It, well, it's the United Arab Emirates. It's where um, the local people in the UAE are extremely wealthy. And it's the money off the, the oil that comes into the country. And, uh, and it's, it's actually funny because when we moved there just a short few years before that, and I couldn't tell you what the date would be, mm. but um, they were Bedouins. They were nomads that walked in the desert and, and had their, you know, their camels and their tents. And, they, you know, and there's still a lot of that still in, in the desert in, in the UAE. But, but when the oil was discovered and the oil companies came in, that's when the money came in. Oh, uh, yeah. And extremely wealthy people, and very, very kind, generous people, just very, very nice. So there was that. I, I, for the first time, I actually saw what the, is talked about in the Middle Eastern hospitality, which is um, when someone knocks on your door, stranger or not, you let them in, and you feed them, you water them, and you let them, you move, let them go on their way. So there was a time where we were playing in the yard, and the, there was a knock on the gate, the giant gate, and mm-hmm. they opened the gate, and there was a nomad that had just, you know, was walking by, and um, they let him in. Wow. And they <laughs> sat him in the courtyard and they brought him food and they gave him water and they let him wash his hands and his feet and he ate and he got some water and then they gave him some food to take with him and then he was on his way. Was that, What is that interaction like? Is the person that, that does the knocking, this, this Bedouin? Yes. Is, is there an assumption about him? Like you, of course they're going to let me in. Of course they're going to help me. What is that relationship like? I, I'm assuming that he must have assumed that they're going to let him in because he knocked on the door. Yeah. But, um, but there was a certain amount of, from the inside watching out, you could feel a certain uh, an, oh, an air of respect almost. Huh. Um, honoring someone as just another human being I mean, because he didn't yeah. really hold any status of any kind. But yeah, to, to let him in and just extreme respect and um, consideration for this man mm. to bring him, let him in and give him food and take care of him and then make sure he was okay and then let him go on about his way. I, th- I actually was very impressed. It was, it was something that kind of stayed with me. It's an image that stayed with me after seeing it happen. I bet. So that was one of the first experiences. Soon after, we found a place, uh, an apartment, and then we set, got settled in. I moved into the, inter- I, I got into the international school of Shoifat and funnily enough, there is such an extreme difference between my experience of going to school in England versus going to the school in Abu Dhabi, where making friends was a breeze, everybody was kind, I seemed to fit in. Now, I don't know if it was me being different or if people were different, but, um, but it was just very, very easy to find friends. It was a quick group of friends. We, we kind of clicked and we were from different countries the US the UK Lebanon very cool you know so it was pretty neat I, so I just yeah. I just googled I, I want to remind myself um, the, the the tradition you were you were talking about mm-hmm. in this Islamic culture mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Uh, there's what sounds or seems to be an exact same one that's an ancient Greek one I mean like the exact thing you described mm-hmm. it's almost a, um, a requirement as far as these people's honor goes, their 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 own self worth, right? Mm-hmm. They're like honoring humans or God Himself, kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's called Xenia in ancient Greek. Oh wow! Yeah, and it, and it was it was it was so prevalent that like it it was one of those the strongest traditions in in, old, in ancient Greek stories and 
and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so yeah. Anyways, it's just cool because it, it is very cool. You yeah. Know, all these cultures kind of come from. Well, it is exactly the same region. Point. So yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. Not to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no, totally. About, I mean, this is, is good. Though, right? It's good. Good information. Um, so anyway, fitting into school was good. Life is is great. Dad's in much better spirits because he's working and he's getting to do what he loves, which is heal people and help people in every way he can. Mom is loving it because she's getting to make a home again. And uh, my sister and I are going to school, making friends, and life is great. The other thing about the culture that I've, this experience I always want to share with people because it was so unique, was while we were there, the leader of the country at the time was Sheikh Zayed. Sheikh Zayed. Yes. That name sounds very familiar. Lovely man. Um, a couple of things that are interesting. He was a um, very interesting man. And one of my dad's good friends was the head of agriculture in Abu Dhabi. Okay. Or in the UAE. Okay. And Sheikh Zayed would call him at hmm. all hours of the day and night and say, meet me on such and such road. Okay. And Sheikh Zayed liked to drive. So he would actually get in his own car and his security people, they hated it because they'd have to chase him down, you know. But anyway, he would drive out. So he was an eccentric man. He was. Okay. And um, he would meet my dad's friend who was the head of agriculture at some whatever road. And then he would get out of the car and he would take his walking stick and he would throw it as far as he could throw it. Okay. And he would say, from here to there, I want you to make it green. Okay. And then he would get in his car and drive away. Well, you're in the middle of the desert. Yeah. So my dad's buddy his job would be to literally bring in soil and irrigation and basically make that section that Sheikh Zayed had thrown his walking stick in to green and and actually Abu Dhabi was like this oasis in the middle of of the desert desert and it's not made for things like this to to exist right so not only do you have to create them and make them happen but you have to put in systems to maintain those to maintain them exactly so what were those systems like I mean are we talking like sprinklers that they have to build drip system exactly so they're really not full on sprinklers but they would literally have every every area that you see has these hoses that goes across all the plants and they have little drip systems where's all this water coming from well they they would I'm guessing that they're um you know, taking the salt out of the water through the processing. Oh, wow, from that they from had. the ocean. Yeah, I'm guessing. And, that, and that's a thing. It. I didn't. I didn't know. That's a very, um, from my yeah, understanding, it's a very really, energy cost. Yeah, but remember, money's not an object. Oh, that's so right. So it's you know just whatever it takes. That's a very interesting kind mm-hmm. of society to exist in. Yeah. So we're. Oh, I'm sorry to yeah, interrupt you. No, but, go ahead. But looking back at it now, do you do you see a a a lack of um. An element of stress that, for sure, at least here in America, we have today. It's brought on by a need of money. We all have our problems, rich, poor, whatever, but a big one is if you can't pay your bills, yeah. there is an underlying just existential stress. Did, yeah. Was that missing there? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's also culturally, they're very laid back. That's got to be a part of it. That's oh, <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> I imagine just so. very easygoing. Uh. Everything is no problem. Don't worry about it. I mean, hey, yeah, even no showing up at an appointment is a suggestion. You know, <laughs> you're supposed to meet someone at noon. Eh, 1230, 1 o'clock. It's no big deal. <laughs> you know, that sounds just, sort of fantastic. Very easygoing. Very easygoing. Very fun, loving culture. Yeah, totally. I mean, what kind of problems do they have? I'm sure they have problems. Of course, but like... But I don't... I as a, couldn't as a tell country, you. you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I'm just... I'm literally yeah. just feeling out loud. But that's wild. Yeah. It is. It, it, it was very easygoing. It was, a, it was a very big difference from coming from... Think about where we were and the strain of... Initial, the strain of a, the, the actual revolution happening. And then, you know, trying to adjust to England and living off of dad's savings. And then getting close to running out of savings. Even though things were a little bit better because we were living in Croydon. And feeling those stresses... Exactly. All yeah. of, and so all of a sudden, this was just like all this weight had been lifted off the shoulders of the whole family. And then everyone around us was very easygoing and lighthearted. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. So that was one thing. If, if you needed money, was it one of the, was, did, was it like you could kind of ask anybody? Well, I, you know, and I don't know if dad, I'm sure that that probably had something to do with it. Like I think probably that 
getting into one of those apartments and getting us started probably came from the owner of that clinic. Like I think they probably, he helped us out with some advances or something that my dad may have paid off. I don't, I'm really guessing at this. I don't know, gotcha. but it is a very generous culture. So it is a kind of, so. yeah, yeah. So I think that would be part of it. It wouldn't be even mm. be an issue. And actually leading into that is what one of the experiences that I wanted to share is mm-hmm. um, Sheikh Zayed's daughter um, was to be married. Soon after we arrived, she was getting okay. married. Mm-hmm. And she was getting married to what they who they called um, the Rainbow Kid. And the Rainbow Kid. The only reason they called him the Rainbow Kid. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> it sounds like a Western, doesn't it? Kind of. It sounds either like a Western or a um, Midtown Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long time ago, so okay. it probably didn't have the same significance. But he, Rainbow Boy. <laughs> the Rainbow. So he was one of the sheikhs. Of Abu Dhabi. I don't know that but, means. N- 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 Sheikh, uh, they're kind of the, the they're um, higher standing kind of rulers of different, leaders, leader is a good word to, to say. A leader of Abu Dhabi. Well, Sheikh Zayed was the head of the entire country. He was the head of Abu Dhabi and then the head of the entire country. But then there's all these, for lack of a better word, mini sheikhs. I don't know. They're, What's they're a like, comparison to some a, a role in our society oh god we, we don't have them in england i could compare them to like the lords they would be lords they would be aristocracy kind of so they're they're politicians they're not politicians Mm-mm. they're not no so they don't have any it's, say so over like political no. decision making no and and also in england lords don't do that like they, it's just it's just a standing in society that's all there's no political okay presence no so it's like a, a title of class it is it is that you're exactly. born into exactly Exactly. Very okay. Very interesting. So, um, and the reason they called him the Rainbow Kid was because he had the sponsorship for Rainbow Condensed Milk, which I don't think we have in the United States. But okay. anyway, it's a brand of condensed milk that was very popular in Abu Dhabi. But he was extremely well to do. Okay. And did he did he carry the title? Wait. So this is a company. Well, he ha- he, w- he had the distributorship, so he would bring in, he would import. He imported a lot of things, but I guess he imported... He was over milk. here slinging condensed milk. Apparently. <laughs> left and right. Doing great. He's like, hey, girl, come get some exactly. condensed milk. Okay, 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 okay. So, um... <laughs> Go on. So, <laughs> so one of the... So they, <laughs> when they're getting married, they're... they're we used to drive There's by There's gallons of condensed milk oh, everywhere. It's yes, <laughs> yes, yes. There's lots of condensed milk. So, um... They moved into a palace that I used to always admire from afar okay. because there were two main buildings in this palace that you could see over the walls. One of them was in the shape of a seashell, wow. which was beautiful. The entire building was in the shape of a seashell. Wow. And the other one was the shape of what you would imagine a spaceship that had just landed on Earth. Like flying saucer? Yes, with like four legs that would come over on each side. On so the side building of it. itself is off the ground? Off the ground, yes. It had four legs that lifted it, like it was raised it off the ground. I'm yeah, assuming this just, building is still there. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's still there. Do you remember what it was called? No, these were the, this was their palace. It didn't have a name. This was the palace that they lived Spaceship in. Spaceship Palace. I guess, we can name it Spaceship Palace. But I used to, when we would drive by it, I'd go, oh my God, I would love to go inside this building. So yeah. It was so cool. But the other thing that was really cool and goes back to the generosity of this, the culture is when the marriage was happening, the, the wedding celebrations went for, I think, a week or two, okay? Wow. And every day of the, the week, they, they had this fairgrounds in Abu Dhabi that was just an open field, and they put up tents, and there would be music and dancing and food that was available to anybody. You just walked up, and you could, you could get food, you could enjoy the music, you could dance and sing along and whatever, and this was part of the celebration. Are RSVPs in, any, in existence, do they exist in this culture? In this particular case, they did not care. The entire country was invited to come and celebrate because she was the crown princess. If you did that in this country... It oh would not God. work. No, it would literally be... It would devolve to a riot within three and a half days. Yeah, but think about the pop, the, and especially in the early '80s, the population difference. Oh, I understand. Tiny country. It's just wild that it that could have be been crazy. a thing. It's it's very beautiful, actually. It's cool. Yeah. Because I mean, like, just the the the, the cultural like sort of the hospitality mindset yeah. of all people, the consideration that must go into everyone's decision making. Yes. I'm just appreciating very that. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. The final night is the most memorable one, which is a week later. Yes. Okay. Is when they actually so culturally, when a man marries a Middle Eastern woman, 
um, he buys things and offers them to her. It's kind of like a, a dowry, but from him to her. It's not what she takes into the marriage. So what he you what he purchased for her as a gift was actually put on display. So these tents were filled with what he bought for her and then the public could go in and and view it all. So one of the things that was very impressive to me was when at the beginning of the tents there were seven Mercedes Benz lined up in each color of the rainbow. Seven. Seven. And each one had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday written on the back for each day of the week. Okay. Um, Very normal. Go on. And then there were two additional ones that were white Mercedes Benzes. One was a limo and the other one was just a plain white Mercedes in case she didn't want a colored one to take out on that particular day. Then there was an entire tent full of just fabric. Every fabric you can imagine so she couldn't have dresses made. So that she could sew. Oh, because you can't. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The princess was not sewing. And then, I, I then there was the jewelry. And then there was the jewelry. And then there was the jewelry. Okay. And it was literally display cases that you get from a jewelry store after display case, right? Of every imaginable jewelry set. So every set was tiara, earrings, necklace, bracelet, ring, maybe an anklet but in diamond, in sapphire, in emerald, in every form that you could possibly imagine. And then there was actually one set I remember that was done in the in the, in stones, the different colors of the rainbow, which was very cool. All and right. then at the very end of this display was a giant jar. And I have mixed feelings about all this monetary stuff being yeah. given as a, for, the, for the bride. But at the end- It's not for the bride. Well, it, for all the reasons that, you know, Right, of the show and the pomp and circumstance and and all of those things. But the one that actually got me and probably most everyone was at the end of the display was a giant glass jar. Okay. And it was full of um, one kilogram bars of gold. All right. 45 of them to be exact. And we asked what that is because they were just solid bars of gold that you see in you know movies and stuff. Yeah. And they said, that is her weight in gold. So he literally bought her weight in gold as part of his gift to her for the marriage. Which... Did she say yes to this or <laughs> something? That, no, like, is, is she given the choice? Um, this is just tradition. This is just... So on no, one no, no, hand... No, 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 no. Is she... Is she does, he, does he have to ask her, will you marry me? In this particular case... There's different things. There's there's the tradition, which in the really, really traditional conservative families, she doesn't get a say. Wow. In the more modern ones, they do. But added to that is that she is the princess. Yeah. And when you are the princess, you really don't get a say. Because this is a political decision. Yeah. there's it, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Far, far more than love. and. So he's know. not... They claim... This has got nothing to do with her. Well, they claim that they, the two of them actually did happen to like each other. Well, they do that on, on The Bachelor as well, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know that. I don't know that. You Have know, you ever seen The Bachelor? I don't watch The Bachelor. I, I can't. I don't either. I'm just saying. I imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, it just it seems yeah. quite weird but you know what I also don't have that much money Well, <laughs> so like I can't really talk about it because <laughs> I can't even wrap my mind around that kind of stuff but you know and there's you have to look at it from there's their side also the other the, the actual intent behind this and I know what because I too being a westernized woman mm-hmm. have trouble with that yeah I must say the jar of gold not because I want the gold bars because I don't know what I would do with them but I do think that is if you're going to be throwing money at someone, I think that's a very, the most romantic way you could symbolize it. Why? The whole, I will buy her weight in gold. I think that's pretty, I, at least it was something personal about her. It wasn't just, I'm throwing money at you. How's it personal about her? Just her weight in gold. Explain that to me. You, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's a, it, maybe it's a female thing, but it is. It's, I, I think that that was pretty romantic. Try to explain that to me. I want to understand I don't know. It. I don't know how to explain it. Try to. I just think it is, it's cool that he felt that she was worth, 
you know, that her presence in his life was worth the equivalent of that, you know, a pound of gold or a kilo of gold for every kilo of her existence. So her existence was golden to him. Exactly. Cool. Like I said, if you're going to throw money at the situation. At least throw it in gold. Well, it's just, I just, like I said. Throw it out of in bars. There are arguments yep. in both directions that we could have probably a debate. Oh, I have no opinion. Yeah. I have. I can't even begin to wrap my mind around these things. And it's also a different culture, a different yeah. time, a different kind of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I can only observe from your words. You know, and it, the fact that it exists means it exists. Yeah. So it's pretty wild. It just it's just like it's like looking under the giraffe for the first time and being like, what is that? Like, you know, I don't know. It's just it was, wild. And you know? it was actually how we were seeing it for the first time. I'm sure. And it was open. I'm sure you're looking around like I was just worrying about what tomato I could buy. Like Here I was wondering yeah. which one would be one pence cheaper than the other, and mm-hmm. here's like all this amazing and it was open to the public. People are walking around. There which is must no... feel like a gift to y'all. It was it was. It was very cool. It was a very unusual yeah. experience, yeah. So that was pretty neat. While we're there, settling in, having this amazing change in life and experiencing this incredible new culture, my mom decides that she wants to go visit home. Iran. Iran. Yeah. So, um, How long have you been in the UAE at this point? I think we were probably there six months, maybe not even a year. Pretty close to Iran, though? Yes. It's just... just it's the south of the Persian Gulf and Iran is north of Persian Gulf. So we're across the water. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. So she wants to go home and see her family. Mm. And so dad is working. So it's me, my sister, and my mom. We hop on a plane. Very short trip. An hour long Was there a flight. conversation before you left? Um, not really. Let we're me. just going to go. No big deal. We're not worried about anything? No. Well, we were worried. Okay, so that's a good question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> life is different there. Yeah. So we literally had to go and have clothes made, right? Because we have regular Western clothes. And over there, you have to wear an overcoat with a scarf over your head. And the overcoat has to reach your ankles. And the scarf has to cover all of your hair if you have long hair. So that part of it was interesting. And dad shared with us the rules, like your hair has to be covered at all times. You can't have any, you know, big time makeup on, which at the time, I mean, I was, like I said, between 12 and 13, my sister was little. So that wasn't an issue as much, but he was very um, clear to my mom. And this is early on in the revolution. So the Revolutionary Guard is very active and very strict about taking people in I mean literally if you're not abiding by the cover rules the hijab rules women were being we were hearing stories of women being taken either being given you know cotton ball of acid to wipe the lipstick off their face which will scar them for life as we've talked about or um, being taken to Evan which is the prison that had the political uh, prisoners and all that stuff you know and so the these so it was basically we were terrified of, of breaking any rules, essentially. Before you even leave. Before we even leave. So we show up, uh, we land, and once again, the entire family has piled into a car that's even smaller than the car that they took us to the airport <laughs> years and years ago. So um, they all show up, we all pile in with our luggage, into this tiny car. I don't even know how we made it, but we make it back to the house. And it's great to see my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my cousins. So we get to visit um, for for a little while, which is which is wonderful. That in that in it, that in itself is is enjoyable. I, as a child, remember thinking how different Iran looked to me. Think about it. The streets looked different because the people looked different. They were covered up. It was a wow. different, just a different version of what I had left just a few years ago. So this is now 1983. I imagine the body language of everyone is very different. Very different. Very different. Things like if you walk into a restaurant, if you're a family, you have one section to sit in. If you're a woman, if you're women, you have a different section. Men have a different section. So a a couple that are not married cannot sit together. 
in a restaurant. Do they just wave across the room? I wonder. I don't, I don't know. You, you know, or you say you're married and sit together. I don't know. Or you don't, don't go out. It. Or you don't go out. Exactly. Are there couples? Well, was there dating? Well, I think now it's probably a, a lot. Not now, but then. Yeah, back then, no. It yeah. was, I'm sure it was happening, but they kept it very, very quiet. Very quiet, because it was dangerous. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So I, one of my experiences is when I was sitting in my, my grandparents' house, and in back then they had um, vendors that would walk the streets, and okay. they would have fruits and things they would sell. Sometimes ice cream, sometimes different kinds of fruits, sometimes vegetables, and they would ring a bell when they would come through. Uh-huh. And mom could hear one ringing a bell, and she screams at me. She's like, "Get out there! Get out there! Stop him! I'll go get some money." He had some kind of fruit that she hadn't had in so many years, and she wanted to, you oh, know, stop yeah. the man. Uh-huh. So I remember jumping off the couch and running out of the house into the street, oh, no. and literally touching the man, grabbing him by his shoulder, and going, "Hey!" stop my mom's getting some cash and stopping at that moment like if you could just freeze frame in your mind right and realizing that I was out in my regular clothes I didn't have my head cover on I didn't have my overcoat on and I was touching a strange man so as a 13 year old with everything I had been told it terrified me because I suddenly realized I could be taken I could be arrested for not having my head covered, yeah, all of those things. Just, what was his reaction? What he, was his face look just, like? Because I went, I'm sorry. And he goes, it's okay. It's okay. Go inside. I'm not leaving. You go inside. So he too knew yeah. that such an innocent thing could have turned out to be you know, <sighs> devastating. Oh my gosh. Right? Wow. Yeah. So he goes, go inside. I'm not going going anywhere. I'll wait for your mom. Such just poison, inside. man. Wow. That yeah. sounds yeah. It's terrifying. It was. It was terrifying. But luckily there was nobody else on the street, so I was okay. And mom went out and got her fruit and she enjoyed her whatever she was remembering. I don't even remember. What did what. she do when she saw what you had done? She didn't even she, I I was like, I was so scared and she goes, Well there was nobody out there. I said, No, nobody was out there and so she goes, well, then you're okay. So she didn't think of the magnitude. And I think maybe as a child it had more of an impact on me. I don't know. Okay. Um, or was it maybe what do you think it maybe been more okay for you since you were a child? Maybe. Maybe. That she could have explained it away if somebody had pulled up and said anything. She could have just said, she's just a child. I sure hope so. I would have. I would hope so. The other, the next incident was a few well, days. Mm, the problem yes. with that, though, is it, at least it sounds like it really comes down to who the person is that catches you. What, sorry, who the man is Mm -hmm. that catches you. Because there's no women throwing women in heaven, is there? There actually were some women for a while, but most of them were men. Part of the Revolutionary Guard? Yes, there were some women that would do this to other women. From what I'm told, I wasn't there, but yeah. Really? Yeah, pretty amazing, Um, right? But mostly men, yes. Wow, it's it's wild. Yeah. Okay. So a few days later, we um, went out for lunch. The whole family Mm -hmm. went out for lunch. And my... As I've mentioned before, my mom is the oldest of six. And so the youngest child, who is my aunt, one of my aunts, is only eight years older than me. Okay. So here I am, 13. She was, what, 20, 21? 21, yeah. And so we're very close. We've always have been. And so we come out of the restaurant, and we're going to walk over and get some ice cream. So we're walking on the sidewalk, and it's a boulevard. It's a very, very large street. Just you two? No, no, no. The whole family's walking. Okay. So the whole family's walking together. And her and I are trailing behind because we're talking and laughing and joking around and stuff and just completely distracted, having a great time. Uh And so I don't remember what she said, but my aunt says something that makes us both double over laughing. So it's (laughs) hilarious. I don't know what it was, but it was hilarious. Uh So we're doubling over laughing, grabbing onto each other, you know, just kind of stumbling and walking and laughing. And I look up. And a car screeches over and stops right in front of us on the side of the road. Okay. So we're on a sidewalk. And four men get out of it and start walking towards us. What? And so I stop and she grabs my arm. And luckily my mother's brother, one of her brothers, is walking a few steps ahead of us. He clocks what happens. He notices. So he turns around and basically walks between the four men and my aunt and I. 
and reaches out and tries to like shake one of their hands and says, you know, um, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Yeah. And they say, well, we need to talk to the ladies. And he goes, well, that's my sister and that's my niece. What can I do for you? And they said, well, we need to speak with them about inappropriate behavior. And he says, inappropriate behavior? I'm so sorry. What have they done? Yeah. He said, they are not acting like ladies. Ladies in public don't laugh out loud. What? They said don't laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. And so I remember this moment Mm. where he goes... I'm sorry. You know, they haven't seen each other for a long time. Please forgive us. It won't happen again. And it's, and the gentleman that was speaking for the four men, I use the word gentleman loosely, um, obviously said, yeah, it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate behavior for young women. They should not be behaving this way. I don't care how old they are. Um, you need to speak to them. And this is not acceptable. So my uncle apologizes for us profusely. And the four men get back in the car and go about their way. And then he comes over to us and says, guys, you got to tone it down and let's just get home. And I remember standing there thinking to myself, who would want to live in a country where laughing, laughing out loud is not allowed? Where joy and happiness, like it, to me, that's what it was. We were having a good time. We weren't hurting anybody. We weren't yeah. behaving in any inappropriate way. But it was it was not allowed, so that was one of the moments where I was like, mm, "This is definitely not for me." This is not the home that I left. Mm-mm, it's not. And the drastic difference. Yeah. You were, your developmental years were there. Yeah. And that's how different it was for you. Huge. How does it happen like that? I have no idea. Huge. Yeah. It was just. It was like landing on a different planet. It sounds like, mm-hmm. like it, I can't recognize people hearing you tell that story. It doesn't sound like humans. Mm-hmm. It sounds like people under a spell. And maybe that's exactly what was going on. Yeah, maybe. 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 And we were very lucky because God knows what would have happened to us. That's the thing. You yeah. Know. And those guys, you know, there's four of them. Mm-hmm. You know. And where would we have been taken? Would they have actually taken us? To a prison, would they have just talked to us, or would they have taken us elsewhere? You know, who knows? Is there a, an element of like um, men beating women? Um, not that way. Not so that they, way. So they couldn't like just beat you for what? Well, I don't wait, remember let's... ever that hearing of that, like a publicly beating a woman. Okay, okay. So let's say that uh, it does not sound like they were Revolutionary Guards. Oh, they were. There were the there were four re- revolutionary guards. Oh, you left that out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, they were four revolutionary guards. Did they have a marked car? They are. They didn't. The car. The revolutionary guards' cars were like the 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 local Iran made Pecon. Uh, it's a car that Iran makes. Okay. And they're you. I from. They're not. At least at the time, they were not marked. But you knew they were. You know the the they were. Do they have like a special uniform? No. They're usually like no ties, shirt, pants, you know, jacket, but no, no tie. So how do you know they were Revolutionary Guard? Well, that that was, I guess, it's interesting you say that because I just assumed that was what it was because my, you know, my family knew that, so they would always say that's that's the guard. It was always whenever you saw a pecan with four young men in it, they would say that four young men. Yeah, they would be like that's a Revolutionary Guard. You said in earlier times of us talking. It was a young people's revolution. It was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Not very well thought through, I would think, but yes. Doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Yeah. Us young kids are crazy. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 you, um, you had a brush. I mean, that's one heck of a lesson. Mm. So then what happens? So then a few days later, it's time to go. We visited. We've stayed probably a month. Did you just lock yourselves inside. After no, that? no, no. That we're still. You know, that's the other thing about the Iranian people. Is yeah. They're they're they make it through no matter what. You know, so you can't hold them down. So it's it's basically it didn't stop us. It was just a matter of you know my uncle was like be more careful, you know just be more careful. But we still went out. We still had a good time, you know. But a I, good time. I, a good time. Yeah, what exactly. What kind of good time? 
that's that's not a that's not fair. Yeah, you're right because I it jaded me. It made me think who I don't want to live in a country where I can't laugh out loud. Yeah. I want to be able to walk in the street and laugh out loud. If something is funny, I want to be able to laugh. I want to belly laugh and not ever be looked at as if I'm being inappropriate for experiencing joy. It's not only can you not look like you, you can't feel yeah. like you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, wow, it's time to go home. Yeah, it's time to go home. So, um, thank, thank God. Yeah, I was ready. I yeah. was ready. I was ready to say goodbye and go home. And so we back through the airport. Uh-oh. And back through customs. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've been Once here before. Again, we've been here before, yeah. a short few years ago. So we go through customs, and they actually um, decide, I don't know why this was triggered, but they pull me, they separate us. They separate my mom and my sister, they take them away into one room, and they take me into a different room, and they decide that they're going to search us, like body search us. So I am in a room with a woman and it's just she, you and her. It's just me and her. Mm. And she pulls the curtain, closes the, the room off, and she pats me down, my entire body. And as she, remember I'm 13. I'm I'm right at 13 right now. And so she pats my body down and she actually reaches between my legs. And this is a little bit tough to share, but um, you know, I've I now I now have my period. So, and in my culture, we we use pads, right? So, um, when she pats me down, she feels between my legs, and she feels that there is a pad between my legs, and therefore tells me she says, "What's this?" And I said, "Well, I'm on my period." Keep in mind, I'm. You know, you're awkward, you're 13, you're just getting used to the idea of being an adult female. Um, so I say, it's a pad between, you know, it's a pad, I'm on my period. And she says, I need to see it. So I look up and have the exact same look on my face that you have right now looking at me. And I said, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And she says, I need you to take down your underwear so that I can see that that is a pad in between your legs. So I lift up my overcoat and I lift up my shirt and I pull down my pants and my underwear so that this woman, whom I've never seen before in my life, can verify that what she's feeling is actually a pad, which is a horrific experience for a 13-year-old girl. so once that's done and she's satisfied, then she says, fine, you can redress. Um, so I do. And then she grabs my hands and she turns my hands over and I had a ring. It's a very small gold ring. And um, it's, just, it's actually just five little very, very thin gold bands that have been tied together. And it's on my hand, it's on my finger. And she says, it's the only piece of jewelry I have on. Yeah. She says, what's this? And I say, it's my ring. She goes, who gave it to you? What? And I said, it's mine. I bought it. And I had, I had saved my money and you know, my pocket money that my dad would give me. And when we had moved to Abu Dhabi, yeah. I had saved money because in the Middle East it was cheap to buy gold. And that was the first piece of jewelry that I had ever bought for myself. Big deal. Right. Yeah. So um, she says, she looks at it for a minute and she says, take it off. And I said, why? And she says, give it to me. What? And I go, why? What do you, why? Yeah. So keep in mind, I've been taught to be a good girl, to respect my elders, yes. to follow instructions, to do what I'm told. So it is taking every ounce of courage to even question this woman. And I'm terrified. Yes. Right? And to this day, I would be terrified. Yeah. So I, I go, why? And she says, because I want it. And I remember standing... Show me your pad, ma'am. <laughs> Maybe that. But I, I remember standing up a little straighter 
and saying, no, it's mine. Wow. I saved my money. I bought it. It's mine. I'm not taking it off and I'm not giving it to you. And she goes, are you saying no to me? And I said, yeah, I'm saying no to you. And there was a standoff. She's looking at me. I'm looking at her. She still has my hand in her hand. And then she goes, okay, put your scarf back on. Get out of here. And I left. And I thought to myself, I'm never coming back here again. Mm. 